Okay, so this chapter here, chapter 20, deals with carboxylic acids, remember we've gotten introduced to them back in spectroscopy and so on. Okay. And then we're going to cover them in a little bit more detail. Okay. So remember that the carboxylic acid functional group looks like that. Okay. C double bond O, OH. And we can condense the acid group down to something like that. Okay. And you can condense it down even more to a group like that. Okay. And so all three of these mean the same thing, and you'll see them written in any of those three ways, so just be familiar with those. Okay. So the first thing I want to look at in these acids is how to name carboxylic acids. Okay. They're pretty easy to name, so Let's see if we can go through the process. So remember that the carbonyl is always number one. So we get two chlorobutanoic acid. Okay. 
Any questions with those names? Okay. Well, let's look at a couple of extra features about these. Okay. We come back to this one. The carbon next to the carbonyl is sometimes called the alpha carbon. Okay. And then beta. And what comes after beta? Gamma, then delta, and so on. Okay. So another way to name this would be alpha chloro. Butanoic acid. Uh, or you can feel free to name it either way. Doesn't matter. Doesn't matter. But be familiar if I said draw the structure of, I don't know, gamma chlorobutanoic acid, you would know what I'm talking about. Couple of trivial names here: methanoic acid, it's also called formic acid. Anybody know why it's called formic acid? Okay. The formic is Latin for the word ants. Ants. So where do you think formic acid is found? What kind of ants? Red ants. Fire ants. So that's where scientists originally got this acid. They would take red ants and boil them and get their acid and then do some chemistry. Okay. But we don't have to do that anymore. Okay. But you can now know that when you step on fire ants, anybody ever step on fire ants? Nobody? Okay, or, okay. Well, I have. Okay. That leaves nice red welts on you that start to itch and so on. That acid gets in you. What you do is you take some baking soda, which is a base, and put it on there. That helps to neutralize it. Okay? So you can remember that if you ever step on them. Did you ever step on them, Quimby? No, no. You need to step on them. So <laughs> step on them. So you get a little variety in your life. I'm sorry, next time I think. Yeah, so you try for Gene. Maybe he can see what he likes. This one here, ethanoic acid, more popular, it's called acetic acid. Does anybody know where acetic acid yeah. is found? Yeah. In vinegar. Okay, so vinegar is really a dilute concentration of acetic acid, typically only about 1%. Okay, so you know what that smells like. So if you ever open a jar of pure acetic acid, I'll put that away, but you're back. If you open a jar of pure acetic acid, the smell is very overwhelming like vinegar. It almost burns your nostrils. Okay, so pure acetic acid is what's called glacial, okay, where there's no water mixed in it to dilute it. It's pure acid, okay? So you'll see that word glacial sometimes. Okay. Let's look at some other acids. 
to be familiar with. Okay, so earlier on, we got familiar with that acid, which is what? two acid groups in the molecule. Okay. How many carbons are in that molecule? Four. So we got butane. And then to indicate those two acid groups, it then becomes dioic acid, so you get butane dioic acid. So one way to name these is like we named this one here. So you could call this ethane dioic acid, propane dioic acid, and four carbons, butane dioic acid. Okay. But on page 942, it gives you a list of the trivial names of these that you want to be familiar with. So this first one here, is often called oxalic acid. You may know where oxalic acid is found in. It's found in spinach. Anybody likes 
Questions on naming carboxylic acids. Okay. Suppose I gave you something like this. Okay. What do you think would be the name of that molecule? Attraction between the oxygens on one side and the hydrogen on the other. Okay, so these two 
acid groups are attracted to each other. This is sometimes what's called a carboxylic acid dimer. Okay, so dimer simply means two units that are joined together. How are these two units joined together? What kind of attraction is that? What kind of attraction is that? Is that a Van der Waals attraction? Dipole, dipole? What is that? That's a hydrogen bonding. Okay. So you get hydrogen bonding there, and you get hydrogen bonding down there. Can you see that? So you end up getting two hydrogen bonds between two carboxylic acids which make up that diamond. Okay. So if a carboxylic acid wanted to melt, it would have to do what? It would have to break both hydrogen bonds. So what's that going to do to the melting point? It's going to make it very high. Okay. So carboxylic acids tend to have fairly high melting points because you're going to break both hydrogen bonds. Okay? So, uh, just to give you an example of one, uh, if you looked at benzoic acid, it has a melting point of about 122. <coughs> what do you think would happen to the melting point if I had another acid group on the ring? It would really, really make it high, wouldn't it? So if you want the phthalic acid, okay, the melting point more than doubles 122. Okay. So just be familiar that the acid group is what makes these things have high melting points. And not only do they have high melting points, but they also have very high boiling points. Okay. It's very difficult to boil a carboxylic acid because we can't get to that temperature. So any questions on melting or boiling points of carboxylic acids? Okay. So again, remember when you melt something, you're not destroying the molecule, you're separating them. In order to separate these, I have to break these hydrogen bonds. Okay. All right, let's go to the next property. these things, we call them what? Carboxylic acids. So what's the question? Why are they acids? Why are they acidic? Okay. So let's spend a good amount of time looking at that. So let's look at the acid group. Okay. And let's draw in all the lone pair. that. Let's see why this thing is acidic. Okay? So let's go ahead and take off this hydrogen because that must be what the acidic thing because that's the only hydrogen there. So if I had a base, that base would take it 
and then those electrons would dump into that oxygen. And so we end up getting that anion there. Okay. So this anion is called what? If this is the acid, this is called what? The conjugate base. Okay, so there's our conjugate base. And the conjugate base is what's called the carboxylate ion. Carboxylate ion. Okay, very important ion. What kind of features does this carboxylate ion have? Okay, you got electronegativity with the oxygens. Anything else this thing has? Double bond. There you go. I can draw a resonance structure. Lone pair next to a double bond. So let's do that. Okay. So note when I do that, the negative charge moves from that oxygen up to that one. So is that charge stable? Mm -hmm. Yeah, because I can get it on two oxygens. Okay? So this resonance base is resonance stabilized. Okay? So I can get my negative on two oxygens. Oxygen loves to have a negative charge, stabilize it, so it's doubly stable. Okay. And so that's why these are called acids, because when I remove it, I get a stable conjugate base. Okay, any questions on that? So let's go ahead and look at some acids and see how acidic these things are. Okay, so here's a few. Start with this one here, formic acid. It has a pKa of 3.75. Okay, so pretty pretty good acid. Okay, pretty good acid. Okay, basically anything under 10 is a decent acid. Okay. Well, what happens when I look at acetic acid? Do you think this is more or less acidic than that one? Okay. Well, let me give you the value here. 4.74. So is that more or less acidic? Less acidic, okay. So in case you forgot, the higher the value, the less acidic it is. Okay. And the next one turns out to be 
eight seven. So it's even less acidic than that. So I see a trend here. I'm getting less acidic as I go down. Okay. Let's see if we can figure out why that's the case. Okay, so here my acid group stays the same, it's just what's connected to it that changes. So here I have a hydrogen, methyl, then ethyl. Okay. So what kind of group will make this more acidic? The answer is an electron withdrawing group. That's the rule we want to remember. Okay. So let's look at the groups that are on the acid. Here I have a hydrogen. What is a hydrogen? A hydrogen is a very tiny electron withdrawing group. Doesn't have much electronegativity, but has just a little. Okay. But what is a methyl group? Remember from benzene chemistry? It's an activator. It's a donor. Okay. So here, this is pushing electron density in. And based on the numbers, this thing here must be an even stronger electron donator because it's a weaker acid. Okay. So this is our first characteristic of these things. Okay? The reason why this rule works is if you look at the carboxylic, the carboxylate ion, and I have an electron withdrawing group, what it does is this charge is not only spread through here, but since this is withdrawing, it can come out here as well and spread out. So it helps to make it more stable. If I have an electron donating group, then it makes it more isolated. And so less stable. Okay. So the electron withdrawal group helps to stabilize it by spreading the charge out for it. Okay. okay, let's look at a couple of other examples of this.
Yeah, the two go hand in hand. What? Can you swim the halogen drawing? What's that? Can you swim the halogen drawing? Yeah, yeah. So let's continue, you guys, this train of thought there. Let's suppose I had this here. Fluoroacetic acid. You think the number will be higher or lower or in between these two? What do you think? Lower. Yeah, fluorine's strongly like more electronegative. Okay, and so its value turns out to be, uh, let's see here, 2.59. Okay. So you can see, based on the PKA, this is a stronger electron withdrawing group that you even predicted. Let's look at another withdrawing group. What about something like this? Suppose I put a nitro group on there. What was nitro from benzene chemistry? Was it a deactivator or an activator? A strong deactivator. So, what do you think about this one? Okay, well, let me give you the value. It turns out to be 1.68. Okay, you, didn't, you couldn't predict that. But now, since you know that number from experiment, what does that tell you? It's a stronger withdrawer than even fluorine. Fluorine's the most electronegative atom. But this, as a group of atoms, is a stronger withdrawer than fluorine and chlorine. Okay? So you see how you can do an experiment, put on different groups on acetic acid, and you can measure how strong of a withdrawer that the thing is. Okay? So it's a nice experimental trend that we can follow. Okay? Any questions on this trending effect? Okay? So if it got higher than 4.74, then that meant it was a donator. Okay? So this is our reference value. Let's look at another kind of thing as we finish up. Okay. Suppose I gave you these two acids. This 
Mr. Tan, can you come up and give us the answer? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> can, can I talk over here? Give us your answer and reasoning, and then we will critique it. Got to use a pen. Just point. Okay. I think this is what we know by. This is the point. Okay. Anybody agree with him? It's fine. Anybody disagree with him? Come on up. Tell us why you disagree. Um, they lobbied and didn't participate. I disagree because the closer he is to the 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 more he will Okay, very good. So the difference between the two structures, this chlorine's closer, so it'll have a stronger effect than this one that's further away. Very good. So, which of these two numbers go with that? Okay, good. You can have a seat. <laughs> there. And there. Okay. So, the closer the group is, the stronger of a withdrawing effect that it has. Okay. Did anybody figure out that reasoning on their own reasoning? Okay. Why didn't you raise your hand when I asked her? <laughs> <laughs> Doesn't matter. She took the risk. She came up. <laughs> Shows you don't have any confidence. <laughs> Okay. All right, so let's call it there for today. We'll to see you on Wednesday. Wednesday.